Hello, my name is Alexandre Adler. I'm a PhD student at Stockholm University, and welcome to my cosmologic from home talk about TARIS, a planned uh, suborbital experiment that will measure the cosmic microwave background to figure out the optical depth urinization. So I said uh, TORUS is a cosmic microwave background experiment. Uh, when we talk about cosmic microwave background experiments, we often relate to Planck because Planck is the last experiment to image the full sky uh, from space. And Planck got maps of the sky and temperature and polarization uh, that enabled it to constrain the parameters of lambda CDM to percent level accuracy, creating the error of so-called precision cosmology. So there are six parameters in lambda CDM, and Planck got them all to within a percent, except tau, the optical depth to realization, which is still only constrained, as you can see, to the 10% level. So the various parameters of lambda CDM affect the CMB two-point correlation function, or the power spectrum, like the ones you can see on the left, in different ways. Um, for instance, tau and the amplitude of a scalar perturbation modes, uh, they both like change the global amplitude of the CMB peaks. Uh, basically, if you increase the uh, optical depth to reionization, then your anisotropies will get rescattered and that will homogenize the universe after uh, CMB time has happened. And same thing, if you have less amplitude of perturbation at the be in the beginning, of course, you will get less uh, amplitude in the power spectrum. So the problem with those two parameters is they're actually quite degenerate and that if you fix the product here, uh, ASE to the minus two tau to be fixed, uh, then there's a way to, then if this product is fixed and you vary AS and tau, then you don't see any difference in the temperature power spectrum, which is why it has been very difficult to constrain tau and which is why it's a major barrier to constraining the, amp the primordial amplitude of the fluctuations. Uh, it is a very large reason because we would like to know that amplitude of primordial fluctuations very well to be able to evolve it to today and look at the structure that we have today, compare it with the structure that we should have because of those uh, primordial fluctuations. And when we see suppression, we can say that it's due to the neutrinos uh, not playing well with structure formations. It's one of the main goal of the uh, future CMBX4. Uh, experiments, as you can as you can see on the left, uh, different sums of neutrino masses will have different effect on the matter and power spectrum in 3D and the CMB lensing power potential. And to get uh, a stronger limit on the sum of neutrino masses, which are the iso, iso, iso bars on the right plot, we need to get a much, much better constraint on sigma tau, the uncertainty on tau. And you see that like getting better detectors that are less noisy or better maps that have less uh, noise in them uh, doesn't help as much as constraining tau. So there is a way to actually make the difference between tau and AS. And if you look at the polarization of the CMB, there is uh, a one that is symmetric over parity called the E mode. And you can decompose it also into an antisymmetric over parity called the B mode. So the parity violated BMOs are quite well known to be uh, scrutinized for traces of inflation, but today we're going to talk about the E modes. So on the very large angular scales on the sky, um, the CMB E modes are actually sensitive to only tau. So here again, I have AS e to the minus two tau fixed, but you can see that. Uh, when tau goes from the lower Planck limits in purple to the upper Planck lim limits by Planck in yellow, uh, the power spectrum changes in a visible fashion. From a multiple of about four, which corresponds to uh, a scale in the sky of 45 degrees, um, it this variation is stronger than when you expect from just the cosmic variance. So it is actually observe. It is should be observable if you can get the CMB E modes on those very large angular scales. So this effect happens uh, because, well, when the CMB is produced, there is a certain amount of polarized and non-polarized light at Z of eleven hundred. Then the universe is neutral, 
So there is no real scattering between uh, electrons and photons. However, as it reionizes from, let's say, Z of 15 to redshift 6, um, suddenly you start having quite a few free electrons floating around. And since there are so many CMB photons, inevitably, some of them will hit those electrons and get scattered. Now, the Thomson scattering cross-section um, is polarization dependent. So if you have a local quadrupole of CMB photons for a given electron, it will emit net polarized radiation and linear, especially linear polarization, which is what we see in the CMB Q and U maps. So the more of those electrons you have, the more of that polarization. And because um, each electron at the area of reionization will see its local Hubble patch and will be sensitive to the quadruple of that Hubble patch, um, the scales at which those effects are uh, relevant for us correspond to the scale subtended by those Hubble patches on the sky for us. And therefore, it is the very large angular scales. It is like scales greater than, let's say, 10 degrees on the sky. However, it's not just a matter of observing the emotes that come from the sky and saying, yes, these come from the CMB and the area of reionization. There are other problems when observing CMB. So one of the, the most important ones is dust. In our galaxy, there is a lot of dust that will have also polarized emission. Uh, the way we disentangle it from the CMB is by looking at several frequency bands because it will have a very different spectral energy distribution from the CMB, which will be a pure 2.7 Kelvin black body. Uh, what one could try to do is observe just a very small patch of the sky that's almost clean of dust. But uh, if we want to you know, probe the sky on very large angular scales, then it's uh, suboptimal to observe only a small patch of the sky. Also, like cosmic variance, it scales as one over the sky fraction you're observing, which means that um, the signal will get swamped by cosmic variance if you observe only a small dust-free patch. Once your photons have made it past the galaxy, um, they also have to make it past the atmosphere if you're observing from the ground. And this uh, complicates our idea to observe at multiple frequencies because the atmosphere is only transparent at a subset of frequencies. Um, above 200 gigahertz, the Earth's atmosphere gets uh, much worse at um, letting through uh, microwave radiation. But there's also the question of uh, the atmosphere's own emissions. Uh, that could uh, mess up with our measurements. So what we need is an experiment with a lot of detectors that can integrate the sky for a long time. This way we bring down the noise in the map, uh, multiple frequency channels to get rid of uh, the galactic foregrounds and be able to image the CMB, and a very large sky coverage. If you're on the ground, you can have lots of detectors uh, the cut, most cutting edge technology, but you're limited uh, in your frequency channel coverage by the atmosphere and you're limited in your sky fraction by uh, what is observable from a given point uh, at a given latitude over a year. If you go to space, uh, like the Lightbird satellite on the right that uh, should uh, be launched in the late 2020s, uh, you can get the full sky, you can get a lot of frequency channels, um, you get also quite a few detectors, although they will be of an older technology than the ones you can get on the ground because of the research and development costs associated to space. However, those space missions, they take a lot of time to make up and they are extremely expensive. So it would be nice if we had like some intermediate where we don't have to worry so much about atmospheric issues or get still large sky fraction and still the kind of sensitivity we expected. Enter ballooning. The idea is if you are floating, you know, at the edge of space, at the very top of the stratosphere, or somewhere in the middle of the stratosphere, or even, you have very little atmosphere. However, because you're not doing a space mission with a rocket that shakes in all directions and the very 
like harsh radiation environment that you will get for several years in Lightbird, you are low, you have a lower cost. You can fly tech to validate it for space later too. So you take your telescope, you attach it to a balloon, you float the balloon up to the stratosphere, then you let it drift with the prevailing winds, with the prevailing winds in the south and hemi or northern hemisphere, observe the sky. That should be good. However, there are inconvenience. Ballooning is very much a 50-50 proposal. It's very risky to fly balloons because, um, well, you're basically banking that your envelope that is filled with helium will not rip 35 kilometers up with winds of several hundred kilometers per hour. You also have limits on how much you can lift there, so limited mass. Uh, obviously, the balloons cannot fly forever. You have limited flight time. And then data recovery, you hope your balloon drops somewhere over land. So on the left here, you have a balloon that flight that happened this year called uh, Superbit, which managed to circumnavigate the southern hemisphere five or six times, uh, fly for 40 days. And on the right, you have EUSO, which was uh, launched just a month later and met an unfortunate demise in the Pacific Ocean uh, within 36 hours of launch. So really, ballooning always comes with risks. Sometimes your telescope don't work when you launch them. Sometimes the balloon don't work. Uh, but when they do, oh boy. The thing is, like ballooning is actually how we got the first degree scale CMB and isotropies. Uh, the twin experiments Boomer and Maxima and Archaeops a bit later were able to constrain the CMB and isotropies in temperature for the very first time. Um, so there is a lot of history in CMB and ballooning. So we know some of the challenges. We know how to fly cryogenic detectors. Uh, we know how to recover CMB data, we know how to do the analysis, how to treat the atmosphere that is still residual at these altitudes. So this is the kind of legacy Taurus is building on. The idea is to take a new kind of balloon called super pressure balloon, which is the one uh, that Superbit and the USO flew with, send it from New Zealand for a month, 35 kilometers up. We would like to observe the CMB at four frequency bands centered on 150, 220, 280, and 350 gigahertz which is where the dust signal, so if, if you look on the right, on the, at the bottom, the middle plot, uh, you can see uh, that the dust curves become more and more prevalent as you increase the frequency, as you go from purple to yellow. Uh, you can see that also it dominates on those very large angular scales compared to uh, sequential radiation, which is the dotted line, and who, uh, in the opposite fashion, dominates at lower frequencies. So we will have 5,000 detectors at a hundred, cooled down to 100 millikelvin, each of which will be sensitive to two of the four frequency bands. And we will split those detectors in three focal planes uh, that will be in three ref different refractors. So on the schematic on the right, the two large optics tube are going to be for the 150 and 220 detectors, and the small one will have all the 280 and 350 detectors. Taurus will then like gyrate at 30 degrees per second, scan the sky, and as it moves through the southern hemisphere, and as the sky moves through the sky, as the sky moves every night, uh, the goal is to image about 60% of the sky, mask out the areas more contaminated by the galaxy, and get let's say 45% of the sky coverage. Uh, because we fly super so long, we can afford to only scan at night and use those nifty solar panels to recharge our batteries during the day. Taurus builds on the heritage of a Spider, which has done two flights out of Antarctica uh, with refractors, detectors at 150 and 280 gigahertz, uh, polarization modulators that are uh, that we will uh, draw on to make the ones for Taurus to reduce. Um, this noise in general and to increase uh, the condition number, which is how well we're observing each area of the sky. And the most important thing is that Taurus will use a lot of the cool scientists that made Spider happen. So the main 
extra thing that you're going to have in Taurus on top of this new balloon architecture is uh, that the multiple telescopes will be pointing for each other to figure out if some signal that you see is linked to some azimuthal dependent noise in your experiment or if it's actually a signal that comes from the sky. And those two extra 220 and 350 gigahertz band that would have us characterize dust much better. Uh, the forecast is that with Taurus, we can improve on factor of two on the Planck 2018 limit on sigma tau. Uh, as you can see, most of the improvement happens on those very large angular scales. Uh, beyond a multiple of 12, uh, we basically end up at the tau at the tau limit that was reached by Planck. Um, and currently, we're still doing a lot of work on Taurus. So, for instance, this is uh, a proposed evolution of the cryostat. You notice that it doesn't look like uh, the picture I chose earlier. Uh, we're working on our cryogenics. We're working on designing uh, the mechanical system because, obviously, when you cool down everything to a few kelvins, uh, metal starts behaving differently and stress starts building up, and you cannot go up in another balloon to fix Taurus when it's flying. Uh, we're manufacturing detectors at NIST, uh, and we're conducting a lot of systematic simulation to ensure that for a given design, we can actually get to our target sensitivity on tau. But we still are making good progress, and we aim to fly from New Zealand in 2026. Thank you very much, and I'll see you all at the panel for the questions.